my name is Tommy Early. We're here on the banks of the Arigna River, and you're welcome to episode two of Three TV. Uh, trees are very beneficial because they provide a range of habitats, and uh, the more trees you have, and the more different types, the better. You know, and uh, you need young trees and old trees because at different stages in their life, they support different species. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's very important before you decide to do any planting to have a, a long-term plan as to what exactly you want to achieve. You know, are you, are you just after to, to make a bit of money in the short term, which isn't a good reason for planting. But if you want to, if you're looking for a long term to support biodiversity, you'll probably plant different species, but you'll be also very careful of where you plant them. Um, uh, the support, obviously, birds uh, nesting in them, but also moths and a lot of insect larvae that live in them as well. All the habitats help support each other, and uh, we'll say they might need one species of tree for um, where they lay their eggs, but the species then might need a different type of an area for foraging in for the, to feed the young. I'm uh, just clearing a tree here that has fallen on the path of the Miner's Way on the section of it between Arigna and Ramachambo. Um, this is a willow that I've been clearing and uh, willows are very important for biodiversity. They're one of the species of trees that we have that support a particular type of moth called the Lunar Hornet. It's a very rare moth and uh, willows also support larvae of other moths that the cuckoo feeds on. And uh, that's why we have so many cuckoos in the northwest, is because of the willow population that we have. So I think it's very important to uh, mine these habitats. And uh, that's why I'm cutting this trunk here behind me. I'm leaving it about seven or eight foot off the ground, so that the larvae that's possibly in the tree will have a chance to come out.
Standing as proud intermediaries between heaven and earth, trees have always excited human imagination. The mythologies of various peoples speak of the existence of a huge tree upon which the order of the entire universe depends, and in early Irish tradition God is at times described as the great architect of the firmament who built the house of the world upon four massive tree posts. This idea survives in spoken Irish still when we praise someone to Cran and Espera or to the trees of the sky. The worship of trees in sacred groves and clearings was particularly common among Indo-European peoples, and there is evidence that in ancient Europe, Germanic, Nordic, Finnish Ugrian, Lithuanian, Slavic, Greek and Roman peoples all worshipped in forest sanctuaries. Reference to Celtic sacred groves can be found in the writings of Roman historians, and Lucan writing in the year 60 AD relates in hyperbolic style how Caesar's troops in southern Gaul stumbled upon a Celtic sacred grove near Massilia, now Marseille. His description reads thus. 
A grove there was, never profaned since time remote, enclosing with its intertwining branches the dingy air and chilly shadows, banishing sunlight far above. In this grove there are altars furnished with hideous offerings, and every tree is sanctified with human blood. The birds fear to sit upon those branches, the beasts fear to lie in those thickets, on those woods no wind has borne down, nor thunderbolts shot from black clouds. Though the trees present their leaves to no breeze, they have a trembling of their own. Water pours from black springs, and the grim and artless images of gods stand as shapeless fallen tree trunks. In more recent Irish tradition, frequent mention is made of famous old trees which were dotted around the country and which are landmarks for public assembly. The Irish word for these trees, which were treated with reverence and protected from damage, is Villa, and there are many places around Ireland which make reference to the Villa. Acha and Villa, the field of the tree, takes the English form Acha Villa in counties Cavan, Leitrim and Monaghan, Achaville in county Cork, and Achavili in Armagh and Down. Alt and Villa, or the steep slope of the tree, is rendered Alta Villa in Leash and Limerick. We find Bala and Villa, the farmstead of the tree, in counties Mayo, Roscommon and Tipperary, and Knuck and Villa, the hill of the tree, gives Knocka Villa in counties Galway, Mayo, Tipperary and Wexford. This brief listing, which names but a small few of the sites in Ireland which reference the villa, shows the widespread distribution throughout the island of Ireland to a cult of the sacred tree, which was very much a countrywide phenomenon. Sacred trees were often associated with inauguration sites, ecclesiastical sites, particular saints, and indeed holy wells, though some of these great trees appear to have been sacred in their own right. There were, in Irish tradition, the five great legendary trees of Ireland, Villa Turton at Ardbracken in County Meath, next to which St. Patrick built his church, the O Moon near by the Moon in County Kildare, which yielded, we are told, 900 sackfuls of acorns, apples and hazelnuts, the Yew of Ross in Old Lachlan, County Carlow, referred to as the noblest of trees, glory of Leinster, Dahi's Branch at Firbul in County Westmeath, and the Branch of Ishnach also in Westmeath. Sites upon which sacred trees grew would seem to have been taken over by monastic communities in Ireland, and Geraldus Cambrensis, writing in the 12th century, noted how Yews, with their bitter sap, are more frequently to be found in this country than in any other I have visited, but you will see them principally in old cemeteries and sacred places, where they were planted in ancient times by the hands of holy men, to give them what ornament and beauty they could. The scholar A.T. Lucas has noted, however, that it was the church that came to the tree, and not the other way round. Writing in 1963, he related how pagan sacred groves and trees were Christianized by attaching them to the Christian ritual while yielding to their traditional pagan devotion to them. An example of this may be seen in the great yews at Mokras Abbey in Killarney, which would seem not to have been planted in the monastery, but to have preceded the monastery, which was later built around them. Aside from its connection as a ceremonial or religious site, the villa was often used as an inauguration site in ancient Ireland, with the king of each tribe or population group being inaugurated beneath the branches of these trees, a practice which seems to have survived up until the 16th century. A particular insult recorded in the early literature was to cut down and burn the inauguration tree or villa of one's enemies. In 1099, the Crea Tolucha in County Antrim was desecrated by the O'Neills, an act which was avenged in the year 1111 when their own villa was uprooted. Aside from kings, many trees and woods were associated with saints. In considering this point, it might be worth travelling to West Wicklow for a moment to the village of Hollywood. Hollywood appears in 1205 AD as Sanctum Boscus, or Holywood, a name given to the area on account of its association with St. Kevin, the monk and founder of the monastic site of Glendalough. Legend has it that the saint was being carried through the area by his devotees one day, when they met with a dense wood obstructing their path. Kevin began to pray fervently, upon which the trees of the wood bent to the ground, forging a miraculous trail for the saint and his entourage. He then pronounced a blessing on the place, promising hell and short life to anyone who should burn either green wood or dry from this wood until doom. Similarly, in the life of St. Columcilla, we learn that the saint so loved the wood at Derry that he was loath to cut down a single tree in it. And we are told that he charged his successors to chop no tree that fell of itself in that wood or that was blown down by the wind to the end of nine days and then to divide it among all the folk of the place, good and bad a third part of it to be put in the guest house for the guests, and a tenth part of it as a share for the poor. Many trees in tradition are further associated with holy wells, of which there are thought to be some 3,000 dotted around Ireland, 
many of which are still visited as sites of devotion and pilgrimage today. They often grow beside holy wells, trees which partake in the sanctity of the well, and on which votive offerings are left as a physical emblem or symbol of the hopes and prayers of those who visit. One account concerning such a tree in Kilcrahan in County Kerry relates how Eastwards from Derry Lan is the old ruined church of Kilcrahan on the mountainside and commanding an exquisite view. Near it is an extremely curious stone cell with a well dedicated to St. Crahan, over which grows a gigantic ash tree, said to be the largest in Ireland. This tree is hung with innumerable coloured rags placed by the pilgrims who visit the well. A large pattern day was held at this holy well, and although the tree fell in 1945, it had been visited many years afterwards, the rotting trunk of the billet still laying untouched in the ground and pilgrim offerings of pennies stuck in a split in it, which showed that its sanctity persisted even in its decay. To cut or interfere with sacred trees is to invite misfortune and disaster, and many accounts relate the bad luck that befell those who tried to chop down, burn or otherwise desecrate them. This following account, collected by Michael J. Murphy, relates the story of a man who cut seven white thorn trees in a fairy fort just beside his house an act which resulted in the death of seven calves. I said John Lynch out there cut a fourth, just beside his own house in Corinua. And uh, I heard him, it, like this is true, he told it himself. He mm. cut a fourth, I cut all the trees down, you know, knocked them all down. Mm. And uh, there, was seven, there was seven lonely bushes in it. And every year he lost seven calves and he didn't know what to do. And somebody told him to transplant, to get young white thorns and put them in the place where he cut the other ones out of. And he did it. And he never lost any more cows. Oh, now that's Coronui. Mm -hmm. As we say, he is over. Just over there. Oh, well, Coronui. Coronui. Yes, that's right. Mm. Other trees, however, were viewed in tradition as being unlucky. The elder tree, for example, was said to be the tree from which Judas hanged himself, and so was left well alone by the people, not being burned, as Mick Walsh here describes to Jim Delaney. The, the, the elder tree. Yeah, the old elder. Yeah. But. There was a bad year. What did you say, what did you say about it? About which? The D elder tree. E L D E R, isn't yeah, that What here? about it? I, I I, I, he was. I didn't. The Judas yeah. hung himself over. Let's see. But there was. Why is it so common that around the gardens, around the house? Oh, I sure it would grow nearly on the road of it fell. Yeah. I think it would nearly grow up with cement. Mm -hmm. And you can't burn it. No one had burned it. It says not lucky and cattle are dying or anything, but anyway, whoever is in it, to have a devote Judas hanging himself. And mm. as the tree is not leaked, although there's nice elder berries on it, mm. could make nice berry mm. yes. health. But are you not supposed to burn it? No. Do, a big bad look. I told her cattle are dying or something, but yeah. anyway, it's no good to burn, which is only like old dirty in a way. Yeah. But there was a bad year, like worse than this. But no one in Borch's bog will be the holy. Not all were so wary, however, and Mick here relates the story of one Ned Halligan, who had a choice response for those who tried to dissuade him from cutting the elder to use for fuel. There was a grey old character by the name of Ned Halligan, and he was the night watchman in Ras Grey Bacon Factory. But Ned was a well up old deeply. But we could talk to anyone. We must have got a good school, but we were terribly intelligent. But Ned went on towards Birch's bug. But he took a, a saw, one man saw with him, and a bill hole. He said he'd get mains of a fire over some of them. But sure, he went on to the turf, and sure, there's only a heap of muck. But Came back, but there was great big elder trees growing alongside the bog road and on the old edge. Lots of the finest. We got Ned picked over and Well, he got hard with the saw and he got saw and saw and saw. Well, then there was others came on and they said to look for it, so I would get a lock of turf too. And they said, Why are you doing it? Don't you see what I'm doing? I'm sawing down this tree. And why are you sorry to cook it up and take it home and burn it? But to say it's not right to burn an elder tree. Why is it, Ned? They said it was over an elder that showed his home himself. Well, because, says Ned, he didn't hang himself over this one and he <laughs> sawed away. 
he didn't, it was in this one, and Sarah down to home a great big load of uh, elder to, bu to Bunker's Hill and carried it, carried it in and burnt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good answer he gave them. <laughs> and we gubs and I needed have no place for anything like that. I'm Many trees in Irish tradition are associated with the fairy host, the other world community who live alongside us in the natural landscape. Those trees standing alone in the middle of a field, or those trees which appear not to have been planted by human hands, were often treated with a certain amount of trepidation and reverence, a tradition which persists into modern times with roads and building sites recently having been diverted around such trees. Did you ever hear much about the fairies around your place? Was there any traditions about them? Yes, there was about the forts that you could never, should never cut a bush in a fort. And an old cousin of mine, an old bachelor, they had a fort on their farm yeah. in a place called Liss Bryan. You could understand there'd be plenty of lisses around there. And this fort, he insisted on cutting down some bushes out of it. And his sister alleged that it was a curse. He, a thorn got in his eye and he lost the sight of the eye. While rooted in the earth, trees ascend towards the firmament of the heavens. They likewise renew themselves through the eternal rhythms that govern all living things, the cycles of growth, maturation, decay and rebirth as they blossom, flower, give fruit and eventually shed their leaves before being re reborn anew each spring. Certain of these proud intermediaries between heaven and earth were treated with great veneration by our forebears and echoes of the worship of sacred trees survives in folk tradition to this day. In this final piece, Lizanne Fitzpatrick relates a story regarding a large tree on her father's land. This tree, which her father refused to cut on account of its association with the fairies, stood in the field despite the ridicule of neighbours who suggested he fell it, a symbol of the special veneration given to trees, a body of tradition which, while stretching back into antiquity, is still with us to this day. See, we have, Tom in our house, my father had a great big tree, and it's a, oh, an awful big tree. Mm. And uh, it's an apple tree. And, of course, it's in, it interfered with me father. Of course, I suppose they have it took over the field where it is now, because the corn field, it was in. My father always ploughed and everything around, and people used to say, you're a foolish old man. What do you think you are? Why don't you throw the tree down and have all that space? Of... No, says me father. That tree is there in our old generation, and that's a real old, old tree, he said. And that's a fairy tree, he says, and I would not touch it. My father wouldn't touch the tree. No, he wouldn't let you go near an apple on it. Really? The poor old... There was an apple. Oh, I wouldn't date an apple off for anything. Oh, no, my father wouldn't have even touched an apple off for anything. No, it's any other trees. apples uh, to be, and still we wouldn't touch them. The cows, like, cows that we let them into the field, they would eat the apples yeah. off it, but we wouldn't touch them, no. Touch nothing belonging to a fairy, you're not supposed to. And were there any other trees, like... No, there was only this one big tree in the middle of the field, like, and it was a corn field, he used to sow it, chill it and all, and everyone was at him. Why did he not cut down that tree and not have that tree there? And my father said, no, long as my generation is alive. You know, we shouldn't meddle with them. They don't meddle with you and you shouldn't meddle with them. Oh, there's any amount of fairies in the country. We used to go at night to hear them. Yeah. What would you hear? To hear them. You hear them in the field singing. They sing to themselves, you see, in the field. We used to go to, and our place was all a big what cross, kind of big cross roads. And we used to all go out and stand at, at, over the, the, the wall. And they said, listen, listen, we'd say. Listen to you, hear them. And that they sang it to themselves there for all that we were. And people often seen them coming home for, at night from dances and all across the road and all. Now, at about 12 o'clock now, at night, that's where you'd see them across the road. Crossing from one field into another. Where do they go during the daytime? Well, they stay in the rat. Yeah. They, you know, they have rats. Yeah. Yeah, they go to the tree, the rat is in the tree, then, you know, they can stay there. I believe they're lovely little women. I believe. I believe they're lovely little ones. And are they all women? They're all women. All women. Little fairy women. So that's why the little child went off the play. She thought they were children like herself. <laughs> there were fairies. All of that. There was any more fairies in the country. That's why we looked outside the door and they were afraid of the fairies. Because we'd hear them. We'd hear them singing. We'd go out in our own crossroads. Where the lads would be going out for the tea in their house. They call it Kaylee.
Hello and welcome to the Arboreal Arts and Reading Group. Um, I'm Natalia Bayless and this is Ima Reedy. The Arboreal Arts and Reading Group is where we've chosen an artist whose work involves trees or forests to choose a piece of writing that they love and want to share that we will discuss together and discuss their work with them um, based on the text. So we're delighted today to have uh, artist Katie Holton with us and um, I'm just going to read a short line about Katie that um, appeared in the article, Deciphering Words in the Woods in uh, Emergence Magazine. Artist Katie Holton seeks to decolonize language and rewild the imagination by transforming letters into trees. Katie, you're so welcome. You're over there in California. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so much. Um, Katie's chosen a chapter from this amazing book, um, there, uh, braiding sweetgrass, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. Uh, Katie, I first came across you um, when you were in Leitrim, actually. Uh, you were up in the Sculpture Center on residency, weren't you? Yeah, and uh, like I just said before the camera started rolling, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, I had an amazing time. It must have been last summer. Time has gone very strange. It's hard to think what was this year? What was 2019? The whole year has, has slipped by in this strange way. Um, yeah, I was there last summer and it was an incredible experience. I had been so wanting to spend some time and needing to spend some time and the Leitrim Sculpture Centre has this incredible residency. So generous um, and you have facilities like the, the, the printing studio. Um, so I was lucky to have time there. It was super special. The one um, problem was that you're given this incredible show at the end, which I hadn't really thought about, to be honest, when I was, you know, offered the residency, because I imagined that the gallery would be, you know, like an open studio, basically, so I could just show everybody what I was working on. And then when I arrived, Sean gave me the tour, and I couldn't believe the gallery is this huge <laughs> incredible it's like going to you know a gallery in Chelsea in New York um so that sort of threw me sideways because I realized oh it's an actual you know massive exhibition <laughs> um and whereas I was all about just diving into the research and the, the making of the work rather than putting on a show so it was a funny um unexpected discovery and it's strange like, I know you're in Leitrim so you're well aware of this disconnect between how people perceive what's happening there but I was like, I, I try to know what's going on in different parts of the country. How did I not know about, like, obviously I'd heard about the Sculpture Centre, but I, I was not really aware of what a jewel it is and, you know, what's right there. And also how beautiful the, the landscape is, my God. <laughs> yeah, Leitrim. <Hey. laughs> you were working on the tree alphabet 
there or yeah I've been working on it for um for a couple of years Mary Kremen and Una Young had a project in Dublin god was it 2017 I think um called the tree line project and the idea was to plant trees uh create like a greenway and so Shodine and O'Sullivan and myself were invited to to think about trees in the city center in you know in Dublin um and we created a tree school and I had really I had always wanted to make a tree alphabet I started working with the trees when I was in New York a long time ago um but I knew I had to you know because we've got Oum right we have we're we all know about this Irish tree alphabet um, and I knew okay I've got to re relearn not that I ever did learn they didn't teach us at school but I've got to find out more about what this real Irish tree alphabet is because I know I have one that I have to to make and share but it needs a lot of research because you've got to do the reading and the time and also dealing with the Irish language um, which I'm not fluent I, I don't have Irish um, and the OM which nobody's really fluent in OM um, we can only best guess what it is about plus the English and the other three alphabets that I've made before only just dealt with the English language so now I was suddenly having three extra languages and alphabets that I had to to play with so yeah it's been three years juggling playing with these molecules of of uh, letters and languages and, and bits of knowledge. The alphabet, it's available for free online for anyone to right. make, make whatever they want with. And people have written poems. I've seen people translate kind of, I think somebody's translated a Seamus Heaney poem into the Irish tree alphabet I saw recently. And it's so beautiful, yeah. Yeah, part of the, the whole point of it really was to give, um, to give a, a way to make it this free thing in the world that people can use. I'd, I started making tree drawings. Um, it was, sorry to keep throwing out dates and time traveling, but I guess that's part of this COVID time, right? We're all thinking about our lives. Um, 2004 was when I moved to New York. I went on a Fulbright scholarship for one year, right? That was 2004 and I'm still kind of stuck here. Um, but it was to research our relationship with nature in the city. So it was very, I really felt like I needed to be in a, a big city. Um, and so I was in New York. Thank God for that Fulbright, because that made that possible. Um, and the the street trees, I was really drawn to them. I realized this is the connection. It's a really immediate, the only connection I was in the East Village that you have with, with nature. Um, and the thing is, I feel that, you know, we're humans, we're animals, we're nature, and everything that we make is part of nature. So the city itself is this organism and and part of nature, but we've got this big disconnect. So this was one reason for me, it was always really important to work with language. Um, but anyway, at the time, I just started making these tree drawings of the street trees, and they were kind of drawn in grids, like the way the Manhattan street grid is. And I, it was like a little sheet of paper, like a a four sheet of paper with these little trees as I was identifying them on my walks because I'm a big walker that's how I learn where I am and uh, learn the world I guess um, and I realized afterwards I think that they were like love letters these little letters that I, you know I was drawing the trees and then it was like 10 years later it suddenly clicked oh my god yeah the trees are the characters they're the the letters we can write what's to stop us from using the oh uh, that's terrible isn't it saying we're using the trees um but in the best possible way like share the trees so it was really it was like this gap of 10 years between when i first so when i was making these tree drawings i'd share them um you know they were in exhibitions and stuff and uh i found online people were getting tattoos and they'd send them to me and then I realized there were hundreds of thousands of these shared things on Pinterest and all these sites. I don't, don't even know how they work or whatever, but people would, you know, set, message me all the time. Oh, can I have your drawing? Because I want to get a tattoo. Um, and so it was always, and I, with the work that I do, I've always tried to share, uh, usually it's booklets. Like from the first shows that I did, I was always making little books that you could just give away or people could take um, as they wanted and because it's about exchange of information and knowledge that's how I see the work that I do it's um we're all learning well I'm trying to learn and uh have conversations so I thought okay we've got to figure out a way that I don't have to individually respond to all these people who want to get tattoos and other things um like make t-shirts or whatever with the tree drawings and so I realized ah font 
if you've got a font, then they don't need to contact me. They could just use it. Um, so it kind of solved a lot of problems. It was a way to, to communicate beyond my own um, human blah, 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 and abstract language a little bit. So we, it kind of slows us down because if you have to translate from a tree, like you can read it. Um, lots of kids, parents have told me that their kids love, some, some kids love learning it. Um, it's like a puzzle. And um, the, you know, the park rangers in New York with the New York City tree alphabet came up with um, like a little adventure activities so you can translate and try and understand what is this code because it's, it's like a code or um, a cipher but I sh should stop <laughs> <laughs> uh, have a cup of tea have a cup of tea what do you what kind of tea are you drinking it's sparries <laughs> sparries hey you know it's so strange and like the, the butter is carry go <laughs> <laughs> <It's> great <laughs> well you know you need these things um, what you said about how you wanted to uh, give the trees their language, um, that they, they would be speaking, like uh, that relates so well to the chapter you chose from Braiding Sweetgrass, which is uh, learning the, gra the grammar of animacy. And um, there's just one line I'd love to read from it. Uh, Listening in wild places, we are audience to conversations in a language not our own. and that's kind of what you're doing with the tree alphabet. You're, you're, you're saying to people, listen to the trees. What are the trees saying? What, what, like the trees have a, a way to speak as well. Yeah, I think with Robin's words, when I read this, like I was just reminding myself of when it was published. So it says 2013. Um, I can't remember when I first read the book because I, it was 20, it was January, 2015 when I, started work on the tree alphabet so no doubt I had somewhere I maybe it was in Orion magazine they had an extract or Robin had adapted this chapter in Orion magazine um that's probably the first time so that was this was in my head and I we started hosting salons conversations at home in December of 2014 um so all of this was there and it just literally came together. It was like, oh, this is what I need to do. It, it seems so obvious. And when you read, like now when I reread this and I, you know, rereading Robin's um, it's such a pleasure and a joy. Is it, to me, it seems so obvious. I don't know how you feel, but when you read this, doesn't it seem like, oh yeah, that's what we should be doing. What's wrong with us? <laughs> it's great the way, because she speaks so much in this about, um language and, and, and how we think of things and otherize things. And so, something that's come up in all three of our um, of, of our reading uh, groups is um, colonization. Like every text talks about colonization and the colonization of land, you know, and the, you know, what happens to the land, but, uh, and then the colonization of language and taking away that language where you don't see trees as other, and as things, you mm. see them as, beings and you don't see rocks as things you see them as things you know living things that are living on a time frame where too 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 fast to understand but uh, mm -hmm. yeah we're all part of that organism we're not separate from that organism we're, we're all one thing and we've lost that through our use of language yeah and so in the same um Natalia, this the paragraph that you started reading at the further down at the bottom of that page you know she says because Robin studied um, botany and science. So she says, to name and describe, you must first see, and science polishes the gift of seeing. So for her, it was very important to have to science and she probably believes in it, but there's that problem because it does disconnect and it separates. And that's part of the problem. And so the tension that she was going through in this book is like the journey for her to realize, oh yeah, the, the power and beauty of science, but then it's also, part of the, the problem um, and working through with her students. And I think her next book is, um, she might have finished it already. Somebody was saying they were with her in the summer and working with the students and following, going further into this grammar of animacy. Um, so obviously I can't wait for, for that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think also the, 
what happened with the language. Um, I'm here on Chumash, Chumash land in California, and Robin talks about the Potawatomi and the fact that she doesn't have the language, right? And there are only, was it seven or nine speakers in the whole world left fluent speakers of the language. And so she's got post-it notes, notes around the house because she's trying to teach herself and learn the language. Um, and when I, when I read this, um, the power of assimilation did their work as my chance of hearing that language and yours too was washed from the mouths of Indian children in government boarding schools where speaking your native tongue was forbidden. And so when I read that, um, you know, I, I have a little post that says happened in Ireland too. You know, we weren't allowed to um, speak Irish. And that's something I wrote about in that piece for emergence, something I'd never written about. Um, and it's complicated because I, I'm not a history, you know, I'm not a scholar. I, I only have this vague notion of, of what happened, but I guess that's what I'm writing as a, a human being with, this is my experience. Um, but the fact that we had hedge schools and people have been telling me that now, you know, during COVID that they've been setting up hedge schools and forest schools. So it's inevitable that we think back to, to what the, the land and the people, what we've gone through now that we're in this kind of traumatic time again. Yeah, and you, and you just, the more you read about thing, things like this, you just see it's happened to all the indigenous cultures where the colonizers come in and they take the trees and they, and they, and they try to take the language. Mm. And it's just like across the world is happening. Yeah. And uh, it's just fascinating to think like, how did that happen? And kind of where, where, can, we, where can we go to reconnect to that language mm. when sometimes those languages themselves are lost, but that language of how we as humans can communicate with nature again, mm. how we can see nature as not just this other. Mm -hmm. Did you read the op-ed that was um, must have been in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago? She's a spokesperson for the indigenous tribes in the Amazon. So she's, you know, kind of demanding um, that we just snap out of it, that this is something that, you know, their cultures have seen coming because they literally see the white man comes and chops down all the trees. Um, but it's accelerated to such an extent, like the news this morning was saying that Bolsonaro's, they're, what is it, 12 times? the removing trees at 12 times the rate that they were. I, you can see I'm so bad with numbers. But it, it's just, it's terrifying. I actually have a piece that I, um, Writers Rebel just uh, interviewed me and it was supposed to go online today, but I haven't seen it yet. But we talked about the um, the fact that the the Amazon and the Pantanal are, are being uh, removed. As, I don't know what word to use at such a rate that it's going to turn to savanna. So what are the lungs of the planet, right, are going to turn into this this desert and we're literally watching it happen mm -hmm. and it, you just feel so powerless mm -hmm. um like wh what do we do so instead of like screaming i just feel like we should all be out in the streets screaming um you just you kind of work away at your own work mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know if, I, if this is making sense i'm just thinking about my own dilemma of what do you do in this time Oh, did, did she have a suggestion in the op-ed piece in The Guardian about how, how do we snap out of it? So when you were speaking, I just realized I need to reread that piece because it struck me at the time as being so articulate and so beautiful and poignant, but also tough, kind of like the way Greta speaks as well, really seeing clearly and this clarity that somehow we, um, because we're so ingrained, it's like with little kids, you know, my sister has two identical twin girls, I'm their godmother, so, I, you know, I I love them like crazy and they're now seven they just turned seven and showing them the world it's always you know whenever I see them plants and we're outside in the garden and they love everything and so it, just rereading um was it Robin uh talking about how yeah kids are open and mm -hmm. they don't see plants and everything else as, as it's and others they see them as real look the ladybird is like it's her or she um a real person but you know the adults in the room bang that out of them and say no it, that's not a human you have to treat it it's separate um and so uh, the, going back to the, the working with kids that's really i feel so important so Right now I'm trying to create a toolkit. I'm working with Claire Breen at the Visual in Carlo to try and turn the Irish tree alphabet into a toolkit so we can just share it online and, and 
have these exercises like what can you do if you're in a, your own hedge school or forest school or a teacher or a parent trying to figure out at this strange time where school is all upside down and inside out mm-hmm. and uh I wish I knew more I'm kind of stuck it's I feel like there's so much you know this toolkit I did the first draft and I think it was almost 100 pages <laughs> but it didn't have the actual like what are the activities it was it was just me listing what we need to do with a sentence of maybe a suggestion for what we do and Claire's very experienced so I think she'll um, be able to help me pull it all together but um, I do I feel so strongly like the not to lump it all on the next generation but I think it's so important that we help kids um, because we've so little time and it, it's yeah. it's so all of it is so obvious a lot a lot of it is about just being outside and breathing, mm-hmm. stretching. Um, and that's one thing, you know, with trees and humans, we have these these fundamental connections, like they're rooted to the ground. And as we stand with our feet on the ground and then we, we breathe in and we have our lungs are even like mirrors of trees. And they, trees breathe out and we breathe in. So it just, it all seems so completely um, simple and logical. I don't understand why, what the big problem is. Why have we disconnected? Of course, it's all, you know, money, yeah. right? Power, oh, money, power, yeah. <laughs> Men, or we won't go there. <laughs> it's, 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 I know, you kind of go, what is it? You, you, you try to stop and figure it out because you're like, it all seems so simple. And then that's what's going on. But yeah, if they could all just get outside, maybe, maybe we need to have like, you know, forest bathing sessions for hmm. anyone in a business suit hmm. on a regular basis. Yeah, it is hard to see though how the GOP, the Republicans, how even a forest bathing session could help them. They seem so disconnected from their souls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I try to be an optimist, but after four years, over four years of this, it's really difficult to see what's. There are some people who I think are just lost to this world somehow, so disconnected. So that's why we have to work so hard because there's the, the beauty is so much bigger and the, the possibilities. Um, there's, it's so exciting, like what's, what the potential. Yeah, 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 it's, it's great. And like with your, I, I'd see your work as, as activism, you know, uh, what you're doing, you're, you're trying to get people to look at things in different ways in, 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 in the area we really need to focus on now. Um, do you, would you see your art and your activism as uh, uh, the same thing or do you kind of separate them out in your head or? No, it's, it's all the same because it's even like me with the Writers Rebel, one of the questions was like, oh, it was something like, what's it like to be an artist in the Anthropocene? Um, and I was like, well, that's kind of funny because there's no separation between being an artist and being a human for me. It's just like, this is who I am as a person. And um, and it's it's odd because I've been doing a lot of writing and and even writers rebel, they work at writers, but I'm like, you know, visual artist. And there's no, we have put everybody in boxes, right? Everybody's always got to be pigeonholed. For years, I was the weed lady because I worked with weeds. Um, uh, a lot of my early works were with weeds. So seriously they call me the weed lady and then um I started working with trees and then I was the tree lady and so it was almost like I wasn't even an artist I was just this like eco kind of geek and there was like there's a separation if you work with the environment in the art world because I was in New York for quite a while you're separate from real art (laughs) which doesn't make sense either but we're always like we're human so we have to understand and put things in little slots so then it it all makes sense to us, but that's not how things work. I think it's also with the academia, why, why we have things separated, um, but really multidisciplinary is what it's all. That's, I do more and more and I have people coming, like I'm talking with a professor at Stanford right now and we're talking about bringing in the literature department, the visual arts, and then science. She's a scientist herself and everything kind of, but it's all about walking. Her class is just going to be outside walking. And she started this like a year ago. So it was before COVID. And she said it was just mind blowing just to do something as simple as going outside for a walk. And I was like, yeah, right. Isn't it incredible? So I did this with the Tree Museum project in the Bronx um, way back in 2007. And we went into classes in the Bronx and took the kids out. 
um, it was much more complicated than that. <laughs> it was very complicated to take the kids out of a classroom. But just doing it when you're outside in the park, you could almost see and hear their little brains twisting around in their head. Because we were just like, yeah, look, at what do you hear? Because we taught them about haiku. And so we were writing and doing little exercises. And it's so, it's, it's profound how something so simple can, can be so, so powerful. And we have to remember that we're just a, a living thing. And maybe this is, you know, people talk a lot about the COVID and what are the positives? What can, how can it help us, this virus? The fact that it is so tiny and invisible. Mm -hmm. um, and other people saying, well, actually, we're the virus, right? The humans virus on the planet. <laughs> Laurie Anderson, she has a piece uh, called Language is a Virus. Oh, <laughs> Laurie Anderson, wow. I wonder what she's doing in quarantine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something amazing, no I, doubt. I think uh, Kathy Fitzgerald was making the same point in her, when we talked to her earlier as well, that she was saying that it's difficult being an artist uh, when you start to say you're working with the environment you're working, you know, if you say you're working with trees or woodlands or that kind of thing, that the real response she got was sort of, well, that's nice, you know, that's that's nice, uh, yeah. nice nature thing you're doing there. And to have it be understood clearly as as a sort of an activism and that, you know, that our colleges didn't have the time or the resources to uh, to to cultivate that in artists, you know, how to. So she's uh, got a whole online program of eco literacy where mm -hmm. that's just for artists to make them to make artists uh, be able to speak more clearly about uh, the environment and that kind of thing and really represent it in there because she would say that artists have a ha, can, can take a space to talk about the environment and all those pressing issues that scientists can't take but they have a different audience they inhabit a different space and they can use that space uh, to talk about it but they need the, the vocabulary and the understanding yeah and that's the one the beauty of being an artist right it's almost like being a a fairy um <laughs> you can <laughs> but you know what i mean because you can because you can just you can flit around uh different departments and just say oh i'm i'm an artist so i'm interested in what you're doing and like the response i've been doing this since i was i went to ncad and since i was uh i was there in 94 to 98 and so the internet uh had just first opened mm -hmm. um uh we didn't really think it was maybe going to take off <laughs> Can you imagine? You're probably a lot younger than me. Anyway, um, 94, I got my email address. It was a Hotmail account. And because I'd always been writing, you know, I've, oh, so I was little, I wanted to be a scientist, a physicist. So I read about, um, I read James Glick's book on Richard Feynman. I was like, oh yeah, that's how you understand how things work. Like when you snap a stick of spaghetti, why does it break into three pieces? Like more than, often than not, it snaps in three. And so he's got the kind of brain that can figure out why Whereas I just go, oh yeah, that's what happens. So to have this brain that can can understand the connections and, and figure it out. And also like the stars, because it's so clear here, we can see the stars at night and to, and the full moon, the lunar eclipse that happened the other night. And to be able to, to join and connect the dots to see, it's just mind blowing. Um, but anyway, I always would reach out to people that I was interested in learning more about their work or having a conversation and um, would do it through letters. Then when the email started, I was able to send emails and was like, whoa, this is, yeah, I was a big fan of the internet and email. Um, but why did I start going on about this tangent? Oh, flitting around like a fairy. Yeah. So you can <laughs> literally just get in touch with, um, with whoever. Um, the privilege of contacting somebody right in whatever department or not even in academia just any person at all um and artists can do that yeah. like there are not many people who can who can just randomly contact yeah. all kinds of different other people in different fields but i've been doing it for a long time and the the power of it because i walk into a science lab and they're like oh it's amazing you know you can move around so you can spend some time here, but then you can also go there and you can share what we've doing. So like what Kathy was saying, working with um, scientists is it's I found over the years that they're they're so excited about this, you know, the potential to collaborate with artists because they know that they need to share um, and get the 
the knowledge and the information out there, but how do you do it in a way that's accessible? And it's very, it's problematic because the heart's in the right place, but at the end of the three days conference, for example, they will get back to the bottom line is, how can you illustrate the, the numbers and the data? Mm. And, you know, artists, we don't necessarily want to illustrate because that's not exactly, it can be what you do, but you don't know at the beginning of a project how it's going to turn out. Mm. Um, like a filtration process so it's i think yeah as artists maybe we can we can approach different uh, people from different sectors quite freely because we're sort of very non-threatening as well you know it, they'll respond to us very as you said they'll respond very positively they won't feel like we're you know after something or up to, except maybe funding <laughs> uh, yeah. but you know but sometimes there's a, a fear i don't know if you find this thick um people can feel uh, intimidated because I don't know why, but um, maybe because we are coming from a different, it comes back to language and vocabulary and maybe. It was great. We interviewed um, Diana Beresford Krauger. I, I keep mentioning it because we were so <laughs> starstruck. We were, the whole interview is just the both of us beaming, but um, she said in the interview <laughs> that uh, science and art are sisters. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was really nice. Mm. And yeah. Yeah, because she's, kind of one of these few people and you know I hadn't heard I don't, how did you hear about Diana and her work uh, through her movie we came across her forest. film the called forest yeah yeah I hadn't heard of her work until um I was in a little bookstore a couple of summers ago whenever the book the book had just come out so the book was there mm. and so I immediately I picked it up and I was like I got to get this book and I couldn't I was like how could there be this woman who's doing this work and I've never heard of her before so then we watched the movie yeah um, and then I sent her a message because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's still, see, that's why don't you have hope that there's there are people out there doing stuff? It's kind of a, a juggle, right? Because it's so hopeful, but then it's also sad because you realize, wait, they've been doing this for so long and we still don't know and we still have so much to do. Yeah. I mean, but the, when I spoke to her, it really struck me when she talked about the, was it the chapel of money. You know, because I'm in America, um, the dollar, mm. the dollar, mm. um, and, I, and she felt so strongly about that. And I, I really un I understand it. I've been thinking about that a lot. We mm. try to figure out what's wrong with these, these yeah. people, the politicians. Me too. I can't figure it out. It's like, yeah, it's just mm. like, are they an alien species? Are the conspiracy theorists right? Are they the lizard people? It's just like, it goes to, you know, I don't, mm. that's my own route. But, yeah. um, but there is so much hope though like i mean like the next generation and kids there's uh, they're so full of hope and they're so on it like if 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 we can get things to the point where they're in charge and taken over mm. i think they're going to be all right we just like there's so much hope and there's so many people doing wonderful work you know to just in in their own little ways like um i was talking to a friend the other day and, and we we're, we're both involved in trying to change uh, things around forestry and he said it's like a balancing beam and there's a few of us over here and a lot of them over there and all we can do is just slowly try to bring one person over at a time mm. until it tilts over and yeah I guess all you can do is hope really and work keep yeah. doing the work yeah. and work yeah, yeah. and plant plant yeah. trees I guess the, the big issue like I have the jackhammer here but the big jackhammer on our shoulders is the time we have so little time to deal with um because it, it's the whole system has to change and this is so this is where i'm like it's so exciting but i felt like this with obama i was like oh the change the, you know yeah. green infrastructure the green economy there's so much potential it's so exciting all these scientists and people who are doing things and then what happened yeah. so it's yeah this constant um i think we're all traumatized in so many different ways um different scales like just the daily trying to get through the day and then the week and then the, the months and the years so it's um it's such a strange important time but then it's also so slow and banal at the same time it's like oh just another day yeah. Yeah. um so constantly trying to wrestle with i did the website the um the alphabet you made that you invited people to send to trump to write letters to trump Oh, the pussy alphabet, yeah. 
yeah, that was ex almost exactly um, was that four years ago. Because that, that, I made that in December um, before he was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. So it was part of the Nasty Women exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> I never work with the the human body. It's funny because my work's so much about humans. I feel it's, it's that's what it's about, really. But the human form itself isn't really there. Um, and so to, to do this drawing of little ladies dancing, like the ABC, mm -hmm. um, it was, yeah, it was, it was fun. Right. so again, it was funny and humorous and hopeful and optimistic. I was actually meant to do it with the composer I met on the street because at the time we had the numbers for the different days of his, um, when he first started and mm -hmm. uh, we were going to dance the piece. Ah, nice. Didn't happen yet though. So did anybody ever write to him using that alphabet? Do you know? Oh yeah, we because I had a show down in the um, Lower East Side. Uh, Jasmine Fiore curated um, a series. I think it was four artists. We each got the gallery for a couple of weeks, and I set up the the pussy alphabet. And I had been to every protest, so I also had photos um, of the protest. And it was funny because people came along and they spotted themselves in the photographs. Um, but we had the computer and a printer, so people could write up letters. And actually some people brought kids. So we had, it was like a family thing as well to, to type because kids love typing. And we printed them out and then I mailed the letters. Um, so yeah, they were sent off. Um, and the, with the new tree alphabets, the, we were inviting people to, to write their own words or translate and suggest things that we could plant because that was something a little bit different with the very first tree alphabet. I made it was just to make a book it was a book about trees I thought if there's a font then I can make a book um, and that was an incredible fun adventure and I loved the book but then once I got the book in my hands I thought oh so when I realized it could be a planting guy you just need to make trees for a specific place so that's when I worked with the parks department or they heard about it and they were like oh my god this is so perfect let's do it um, then you can literally just say okay the word love then you get your trees, your four trees, and you plant them. And maybe it's a secret, or maybe they're signposted. Um, they might live longer than we live. Um, so that's, and we're hoping to do that down in Carlo now with the Irish tree alphabet. So people can send us their messages. Um, you know, ideally, we would have been doing it this year, but, you know, things happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I like what you said about, um, like, about, like, you're, you're a human making art, and, like, we, we're, we keep talking about how this is, uh, what we're talking about is about trees, but the trees are fine. Really what we are talking about is, is, is humans and how, and how we're, and how we're we interacting and we need the trees. Yeah. And what we're doing. And it is, it really is all like, you know, before I was like, oh, it's a festival of trees. And you're like, and humans. And it's so true. Like we have to remember it's, it's us and it's what we're doing. Um, it, it's not, it's not, nature, it's not biodiversity, we really need to look at ourselves. And, you know, that, that was, but so much of that is in here about like, just looking at ourselves and how we're perceiving everything around us and our own, our own role in it. Yeah, there are actually some redwood defenders up um, further north, northern California. Um, they've been up there for, I think they said 242 days now in wow. the trees. Wow. Hmm. I feel so torn because I'm like, you know, when I was little, I always thought that's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like, okay, I have other work yeah. Yeah. to do and that's important. And um, have you got anything exciting coming up you want to share with us? Well, working on this toolkit, which is, <laughs> I think, super exciting. Um, but I, I just need to, it's been really hard because, like I said, these writing projects and all the other things, because I think working on the Irish tree alphabet was all through spring, summer. Um, so that whole chunk of time, I put off a lot of other things. And so now I'm, you know, when you're climbing through your email mountain, um, discovering things that have been put off for a long time. So I'm supposed to be sending drawings over to Germany. I guess everything else is all, the other thing is that it's kind of confused whether things are happening. Oh yeah. Do you get like quick send the things because it's going to open, yeah. and then it's like oh wait no we're locked down again. Yep. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> so I'm so I'm I'm really excited about the tree school toolkit, um, yeah. but like I said yeah the actual sitting down and doing it has been hard because um, 
my time has been taken up with other things that I'm hoping now are finally finished. Like it's the 1st of December, this is supposed to be the, the toolkit time. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, it's really beautiful, your work. And it's been such a pleasure uh, mm. that you've taken your time out to join us today. And um, Thank you both. Yeah. Hopefully I'll see you in Leafroom one day or Cork. Yes, please. That'd be wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Maya Sophia. Um, this is a song called Four Winters, which I was very happy to be commissioned by the doc to write. Um, it kind of, the beginning of the song came to me while I was on a little evening walk by the canal around Dublin 7 and was sitting under the birch trees there and the first few lines of the song were born. So. That's how it came about, and that's the kind of healing power of moments like that are kind of the, what the song is about. And this is Dan Walsh on saxophone and Chris Barry on bass. I'm really happy to have them here. Okay, so this is Four Winters. Thank you for everyone at the dock for having us. <laughs> Go.
everything. 